When I speak of disappointment, everybody knows at once what I mean. One need not be a sentimentalist. One may realize the biological and physiological necessity of suffering in the economy of human life, and yet, one may condemn the methods and the aims of war, and long for its termination. To be sure, we used to say that wars cannot cease as long as nations live under such varied conditions, as long as they place such different values upon the individual life, and as long as the animosities which divide them represent such powerful psychic forces. We were, therefore, quite ready to believe that for some time to come there would be wars between primitive and civilized nations, and between those divided by color, as well as with and among the partly enlightened and more or less civilized peoples of Europe. But we dared to hope differently. We expected that the great ruling nations of the white race, the leaders of mankind who had cultivated worldwide interests and to whom we owe the technical progress in the control of nature, as well as the creation of artistic and scientific cultural standards, we expected that these nations would find some other way of settling their differences and conflicting interests. Each of these nations had set a high moral standard to which the individual had to conform if he wished to be a member of the civilized community. These frequently over-strict precepts demanded a great deal of him, a great self-restraint, and a marked renunciation of his impulses. Above all, he was forbidden to resort to lying and cheating, which are so extraordinarily useful in competition with others. The civilized state considered these moral standards the foundation of its existence. It drastically interfered if anyone dared to question them, and often declared it improper even to submit them to the test of intellectual criticism. It was therefore assumed that the state itself would respect them, and would do nothing that might contradict the foundations of its own existence. To be sure, one was aware that scattered among these civilized nations there were certain remnants of races that were quite universally disliked, and were therefore reluctantly and only to a certain extent permitted to participate in the common work of civilization where they had proved themselves sufficiently fit for the task. But the great nations themselves, one should have thought, had acquired sufficient understanding for the qualities they had in common and enough tolerance for their differences so that, unlike in the days of classical antiquity, the words foreign and hostile should no longer be synonyms. The enjoyment of this common civilization was occasionally disturbed by voices which warned that, in consequence of traditional differences, wars were unavoidable even between those who shared this civilization. One did not want to believe this, but what did one imagine such a war to be like if it should ever come about? A state at war makes free use of every injustice, every act of violence that would dishonor the individual. It employs not only permissible cunning, but conscious lies and intentional deception against the enemy, and this to a degree which apparently outdoes what was customary in previous wars. The state demands the utmost obedience and sacrifice of its citizens, but at the same time it treats them as children through an excess of secrecy and a censorship of news and expression of opinion which render the minds of those who are thus intellectually repressed defenseless against every unfavorable situation and every wild rumor. It absolves itself from guarantees and treaties by which it was bound to other states, makes unabashed confession of its greed and aspiration to power, which the individual is then supposed to sanction out of patriotism. <laughs> 
For the individual, too, obedience to moral standards and abstinence from brutal acts of violence are, as a rule, very disadvantageous. And the state but rarely proves itself capable of indemnifying the individual for the sacrifice it demands of him. Nor is it to be wondered at that the loosening of moral ties between the large human units has had a pronounced effect upon the morality of the individual. For our conscience is not the inexorable judge that teachers of ethics say it is. It has its origin in nothing but social fear. Wherever the community suspends its reproach, the suppression of evil desire also ceases, and men commit acts of cruelty, treachery, deception, and brutality, the very possibility of which would have been considered incompatible with their level of culture.